Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Aspiring Public Health Professionals webinar featuring CDC's Epidemiology Elective Program, also known as EEP. My name is Kelly Cordera, and I am an epidemiologist in CDC's Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Laboratory Services, and the lead for student programs and partnerships within the Epidemiology Workforce Branch, which includes the Epidemiology Elective Program. Today, our program coordinator, Tini Sheff, will provide a short overview about the experiential program, application process, and our timelines. Then I will turn things over to Captain Eric Pevsner, who will lead us in a panel discussion with our EEP alumni who are now serving at CDC as Epidemic Intelligence Service Officers. We will also have time for questions at the end of the session. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please add them to the chat. Chini? Thank you, Kelly. My name is Chini Shutt, and I'm an ORS fellow at CDC and EAP program coordinator. Let's get started. As many of you know, the Epidemiology Elective Program, EEP, introduces medical and veterinary students to applied epidemiology, public health, and global health through hands on experience and mentorship by senior subject matter experts. EEP trains student clinicians in applied epidemiology and places them with mentors for hands-on experience as they provide a public health service for six or eight weeks. These six or eight week rotations are available beginning in January and March of each year. In this picture, you'll see EEP student Amy G deployed to the Maricopa Department of Public Health in Arizona in March 2020 as a part of CDC's response to the novel coronavirus outbreak. Amy worked side by side with an EIS officer and used her medical training and ability to speak Mandarin to follow up with people who had suspected COVID-19 illness to check their daily symptoms. So as you can see, medical and veterinary students can get hands-on public health experience with EEP, which is a great step in the journey to becoming a CDC disease detective. The EPI elective program is for med medical and veterinary students who are enrolled in a fully, US a fully U.S. accredited medical or veterinary school located in the United States. Each year, we select between 50 to 60 students from different schools and backgrounds to participate in one of four cohorts, two of which start in January and two of which start in March. As a cohort, students uh, start their rotations with a three-day orientation training and then are placed with host sites across the agency and beyond to complete projects. In many cases, students are provided with opportunities above and beyond their projects. For example, here we have EEP student Anna Lofman. Anna met former U.S. Gen Surgeon General Dr. Jerome M. Adams during her EEP rotation at a special event highlighting the importance of public health and mosquito vector control. The short-term epidemiology projects vary based on the host site, but could include participating in surveillance of a disease, injury, or other health condition, analyzing health data to identify new risk factors for disease, assisting in the field to investigate an outbreak, and contributing to CDC publications and guidelines of major public health importance. During the rotation, students could also attend CDC presentations, network with CDC staff, and in some cases, assist EIS officers in the field and co-author scientific articles. So although many of our students are matched with host sites and mentors in CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, some students match with domestic CDC sites like San Juan, Puerto Rico, Fort Collins, Colorado, Anchorage, Alaska, or Cincinnati, Ohio. Students support other federal sites like National Park Service and Indian Health Service. As our program expands, we're increasing emphasis on opportunities on placing students with state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments across the United States. Because the bulk of public health work is conducted at the state and local level, these positions often provide a wide breadth of public health experience and, and can allow students to support public health closer to home. The map provided shows uh, host site locations for the 2022 uh, host sites, but you will see more orange on this map in the future. Another aspect of our growing program is our connection to the EIS program. 
Throughout EEP rotations, many students can work closely with our EIS officers and see EAP as an opportunity to network with CDC staff across the agency that can support their future career goals. For example, on this slide, you'll see a picture of John Rosso. Back in 2016, John was a veterinary student who participated in EAP. In 2020, John went on to become an EIS officer and was recently selected to a new prestige program called the Future Leaders in Infections and Global Health Threats, or also known as FLIGHT. Um, you will see that John is a lieutenant in the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service. Like John, many of our graduates are on the path to becoming our nation's next health leaders, which may also include other CDC training programs like EIS, the CDC Preventative Medicine Residency Program, as well as the flight program. Another example of this is the story behind this picture. Dr. Alexandra Medley, a veterinarian and PH graduate, is also a flight officer and former EIS officer who had her first experience at CDC with EEP in 2016. During her rotation, she worked with the pox virus and rabies branch to determine strategies to increase rabies vaccination coverage in dogs. On this slide, you will find a testimonial from one of our recent EEP graduates, Max Cohen. We know that some students who participate in EEP ultimately decide to stay in veterinary or human medicine, and that is completely okay. This program is designed to provide you with relevant public health skills and experience to help you build your skill set and expertise, including skill set and perspective that can translate into clinical work if that is the career path you choose. You can read more about um, our alumni testimonials at cdc.gov slash epielective. We will add a link to the website in the chat box. The application cycle for EEP opens annually. It is currently open through March 31st, 2022 and will close at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All applications and supporting materials must be received by the deadline. Supporting materials include two letters of recommendation, one of which must be completed by a faculty member at your current medical or veterinary school, and the academic endorsement form, which must be signed by the Student Affairs Office at your school. On the application, students can provide their preferences for one of four set rotation dates, geographic location, and topic areas, and projects of interest. This information is used to match finalists with host sites. Selected applicants will be notified via email by June 30th. To learn more about the application process and for other frequently asked questions, please visit the EEP program application information page, and we will add that link to the chat as well. Thank you, Ginny, for that very helpful program overview. Again, if you have questions about the program or the program application process, please go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Um, if you would like to contact us separately to ask those questions, you can also email us at epielective at cdc.gov. So from here, we will turn it over to Captain Eric Pevsner, who is the Chief of the Epidemiology Workforce Branch and the Chief of the Epidemic Intelligence Service Program. And he will introduce each of our panelists and launch a discussion with those panelists. Eric, take it over. Thanks, Kelly, and thanks, Chinny, for that great overview and for the introduction. And thanks to everybody for attending. You know, this is a really awesome program. If you really think you have any potential interest in a career in public health and blending your clinical skills with public health training, this is really a unique opportunity to come to CDC or get assigned to a state or local health department and really gain some experience and see if this feels right for you. And if it does, this is a real springboard to some awesome opportunities, including the Epidemic Intelligence Service, but not limited to that. So, but instead of hearing it from me, you're gonna to get to hear it from three people that went through this program are now current officers in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And it's got a great ring to it. We've got David, Aaron, and Karen. It sounds like some morning show. <laughs> and so they've got a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. And so what I'm gonna ask is each of you, we're gonna start with, with David, since I mentioned your name first, if you could just say a little bit about your background and how you ended up in the Epi Elected program. Thanks, Eric. So I'm David Philpott. Um, 
I am a pediatrician, most recently, like finished pediatric residency just before starting EIS. But getting into EEP started, um, I was a teacher in high school, and then I went um, and realized I wanted to do my uh, to do MPH after thinking about it some more. And in that process, met someone who was an EIS officer. And she was kind of one of my initial mentors. And she, A, mentioned this program to me because she did it when she was in vet school and then did EIS later on. And B, I just figured out that, oh, this is actually, I'm, I'm definitely much more of an applied public health person. And I want to kind of get experience with that soon um, and on the earlier side to, to kind of confirm that um, and, and kind of confirm maybe EIS down the line because I, I thought what she did was really cool. So I, this was kind of the way for me to help evaluate that. And it was awesome. Thanks, David. Thanks for adding that awesome exclamation mark at the end. All right. Now we went from David. Let's go over to Aaron. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up in Epi elected, please. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Aaron Ricketts. I'm also an MD. Um, I am in internal medicine. I finished my residency also right before uh, coming to EIS. Um, I applied for the Epi elective because when I was about 20, well, I read a book about the CDC and the EIS, and I told my mom I wanted to do that when I grew up. And uh, then I just had to convince everybody else that it would be a good idea, um, including my school when I tried to convince them that I wanted to do this elective and they had no idea what I was talking about. Um, so yes, it was a lot of fun. But um, I, I actually found EEP because I was stalking the CDC website and all of its programs and that uh, is how I ended up there. And I'm really, really glad I did because it absolutely solidified my desire to go work in public health. So yeah, thanks for having a website. Great. Thanks, Aaron. You know, when I was 12, I think I told my mom I was going to be a firefighter. So I'm glad you reached what you, you knew what you were going to do and you made it happen. I, I didn't quite make it happen. Although some days it does feel like I kind of put out some fires, but anyways. Uh, right. I will say there was an awkward moment where my mom videotaped me at like six years old saying I was going to be a ballerina artist. So I still haven't lived that one down. All right. Well, there, there's still time. All right. <laughs> thanks, Aaron. Um, Karen, tell us about your background and how you ended in the epi elective, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen. I'm a veterinarian by training, so representing all of the vets out there. Um, I actually um, got my MPH prior to going to vet school, which is um, sort of a weird path, um, but I definitely wanted to go into public health. And I found out about the EIS program, which we are all currently a part of, and um, and decided that that's what I needed to do. Um, so I went to go get my DVM and like Aaron, I was trying to get any public health experience possible during my DVM. And I stumbled across the epi elective program on the website. And, um, so I got, and like I applied, got in, and it was just such a fantastic experience and exposure into CDC. Um, and I think like, it's an excellent opportunity if you have the chance to do it. Thanks everyone. Excited to talk to you all. Great. Thanks, Karen. So I think that's a perfect entree. So, you, you know, you mentioned you had a fantastic experience during Epi Elective. Can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you did and what made it so fantastic for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was with the Bacterial Special Pathogens branch, um, and I was um, onboarded as, you know, an epi elective student, and I was supposed to help with um, leptos, uh, lesbosporosis and uh, looking at a literature review on leptosporosis in dogs. However, um, conveniently enough, there was, or inconveniently enough for everyone who was involved, um, there was an epidemiologic assistance requested. So that's an epi aid um, where the state of Texas required requested help from CDC on a mass exposure to Brucella RB51. And conveniently enough, I was there. So I was able to be very involved in this investigation. Um, you know, we did things like call um, households to inform them of the exposure. We then put together a questionnaire and like, I was able to be very involved in this project. Like, um, managing databases, making phone calls. Like we were very, very involved in this inve entire investigation. Um, so it was a very special experience. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. All right. Uh, we'll keep going back in reverse order here over to Aaron. Aaron, tell us a little bit about your epi elective experience. I was placed in the mycotics, uh, mycotics branch. We had way too much fun in the very short time that I was there with EEP. Um, 
I think, I think I was part of probably six or so projects in a few weeks, um, ranging from, um, the reviewing uh, new Canada Oris outbreaks in uh, the Chicago, greater Chicago area to um, trying to determine how to treat swamp cancer, which was um, the, I think the more fun name for an oomycetes infection, which uh, was really interesting because there was a lot of um, back and forth in the CDC about where that actually fell. Uh, if, it's it's actually not really a fungus and it's not really uh, an algae. It's kind of right in between. And so I think at some point someone flipped a coin and decided fungus gets it. Um, and so that was a, that was a really interesting project because it was just one person uh, with one infection. And the question was how much we had to worry about other people being infected, um, what we could do to, to help uh, help them treat the infection or prevent it from happening to anybody else again. Um, we didn't have an epi aid for it, but there was a lot of discussion about whether it might be necessary and what the local health department should help do um, to, to, to deal with the infection. Just some really, really interesting uh, in-depth conversation about something that's so rare that I hope I never see it again, frankly, um, but a lot of fun. Great, thank you for sharing that rare experience that you know so often part of some people's training. So over to you, David, why don't you tell us about what was uh, special and helpful for you in your epi-elective training? Thanks, Eric. So I was in the Division of Global Health, Emergency Response and Recovery Branch, which you would think that that meant I went a lot of cool places, but actually it was great prep for COVID because one of the person I worked closely with was in another state. <laughs> So I was working remotely with her at that point, but and um, anyway, it was it was great uh, in that. And actually, working with her, um, I worked with her all throughout the rest of residency on one project, and then she actually just gave me another one because she had no one else to do the work. Um, but that project was great because um, it was focused on emergency response, um, specifically looking at detainees um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and figuring out how can we screen those individuals. Um, for malnutrition more easily and more quickly. And the reason I loved the project and the reason that I kind of like need to go, yeah, this is what I want to do even when I was in residency was um, we did this analysis. It's all sensitivity, specificity, all sorts of stuff. Um, went through CDC clearance, but the end result was there's a paper out of it that I finally got published, right? As I started EIS. But the main thing was that um, they've changed policy. International Community of the Red Cross has implemented our analysis and changed policy and now people are able to be screened much more frequently so they're able to catch detainees um, in these places of detention um, for malnutrition much faster and so that was like immensely satisfying to me because it wasn't just an academic paper that i was cranking out um, it was actually public health action was taken based on the work that i got to do while i was there and it potentially could impact a lot of people and so that's kind of the reason that i say it was awesome <laughs> Yeah, that is awesome to get to be here for a short period of time and contribute to an investigation that resulted in policy change that'll impact thousands of thousands of lives. So that's uh, thanks for sharing that. That's really great. Uh, who wants to share? So, you know, I think a lot of times what we hear from clinicians is, you know, you guys invest, invest a lot of time learning to be clinicians and to work on a one on one basis with humans or in Karen's case, animals. And that's a significant investment in time. And so now suddenly you're jumping to something else, to public health, where it's taking you away from that individual focus to population focus. And that's a major decision point for a lot of clinicians. Who wants to kind of speak to that and talk about how Epilective and um, might have helped you with, with that decision? I, I, I think I'll start with that because I think for me, it was it was a pretty easy decision. Um, I always knew that I liked public health and I fell in love with medicine when I was doing that as well. Um, because I think, I think for the most part, everybody who ends up here comes here because they want to help people at the end of the day. Um, and it's a question of how to best do that and, and what, what provides us the personal fulfillment that we need in our lives uh, with, with doing that. And the question of, is that something that I see more in direct one-on-one -on -one care, or I see more in kind of talking about what David was saying with these big policy changes that can impact so many more people. Um, and I, I think that that was something that 
I really got out of EEP was seeing like, yes, I, I really do get a lot of fulfillment from being able to impact these systems in this way. And knowing that medicine is not just, you know, learning to take care of one patient at a time. A lot of our medical training is learning the medical system and what goes into it and how it works and how you get from, you know, a patient who's sick to somebody who's doing better. And having that background and knowledge and information is so important for a lot of our public health strategies, because we need to know what's going on in, in the hospitals, in the clinics, um, and, and in, in folks that aren't ending up in the hospitals and the clinics. And having that training does give us the ability to make a difference to all of these people. I'm happy to go next. Um, so in terms of um, veterinary medicine, um, you know, a lot of what we learn, like that clinical information, like Aaron was just saying, like is really applicable to what we learn. Um, there is one thing in vet medicine uh, where we learn a lot about population health. And so that is sort of reflective in CDC's practices and public health in general. So you actually get to use those skills that you learned about, you know, herd of cattle in and like apply them. Um, also, like one thing that is actually really pertinent right now, um, we are actually looking into um, an epi aid in cases of blastomycosis for both animals and humans. Um, and actually, we're planning on doing a you know a seroprevalence survey. And so this actually involves you know using medical skills. So we're going to like collect blood and assist the state. Um, and so you know, this is not the end of your medical career joining public health. There are many opportunities to use those clinical skills um, and applying them to public health. And in addition, um, in other studies that we've been involved in, um, it's been very helpful to have that clinical knowledge and ability to read a medical chart and also be, and just have awareness of the disease and just have a baseline, you know, knowledge of them. So you can actually think about them in an epi capacity. Um, of course, um, I'm actually in the mycotic diseases branch, um, that Erin did her epi elective in. Um, and, you know, even if you don't know things like uh, you know, being able to quickly glance at an article and really understanding the like um, pathology behind a disease is uh, very helpful. Um, yeah, thanks. I'll pass it on to David. Or if you had another question, Eric, we can move on. <laughs> I, 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 okay. So, I mean, the main one for me, I, I just, I can talk a long time. So the main one for me is, um, what I already said, which is like when I was thinking about this, like I could, you know, see individual patients in the ED, whereas this, like, it was like with this analysis, we're going to really help um, a lot of people. Um, that's one thing for me. And then just to like what um, Karen was saying, like, it is super helpful for me to have my medical training when we're thinking about chart reviews. And then also like when we're thinking about outputs for if we're writing up like an MMWR, I love having the clinical background because I'm like, well, I want a pediatrician to read this and I want them to know this from it because that's the question they're going to want to know. And I want to make sure we're aligned with that, um, I think is, is the other thing that I have um, found immensely helpful. My work right now, I work on HIV clusters and I actually also have found how I think clinically is very relevant to think about clusters of disease transmission, which is like taking the history of it. And then what's your assessment of it and what's your plan to work on it is actually extraordinarily applicable to what I do for a lot of these HIV clusters because we have to decide how to work on it. And that's really how I actually process through the problem. I don't know that everyone that I work with feels that way, but that's how that's how I actually process it. And just the mode of thinking I have as a clinician, I have found is extraordinarily relevant to, to that work. <laughs> Great. Thanks, each of you, for sharing that perspective. Um, let's go over to Karen. Karen, you know, so you 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 did your clinical training, you you did epilective, it launched into you applying and being accepted into the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Can you talk about some of your work that you're doing right now as an EIS officer? Yeah, um, there's a lot of different hats that EIS officers wear. Um, I think everyone will agree with that. Um, 
And there's, you know, field positions and also headquarter positions. So um, I'm currently in the headquarters. Um, I have a lot of different projects going on, of course, like, um, you know, I think all of us at this point have been working on COVID in some capacity. Um, but in addition to that, um, currently in EIS, um, we do have, I am working on, you know, things like um, candidemia surveillance um, and looking at factors that affect um, mortality in patients with candidemia. And we look at surveillance systems that are currently ongoing in the United States, and we take data from them and do um, analyses on that. Um, there's a lot of work on ringworm, um, which is not necessarily something that my branch actually did in the past. They, this is kind of a niche that, um, because I'm a veterinarian, it feel, fell very nicely in my lab. And so there's cases of drug resistant ringworm going on in uh, globally. And so therefore, because I'm a veterinarian, um, this is something that I have now started to lead in my branch. And so there's a lot of opportunities and things that you can sort of carve out. Um, and I must say, uh, I know this, I'm kind of sounding like a broken record at this point, but as a token veterinarian in the branch, it's kind of nice because anything that comes in dealing with an animal automatically gets routed to you, uh, regardless of if you are, if it's a sea otter, which I have never touched in my life, I've only seen an aquarium, um, versus like any other animals, like I get looped in and that's actually very, uh, nice to have, um, but yeah, we do a lot of different projects from analytics to epi aids to cluster investigations and supporting state and local health departments. That is another thing that we do pretty often. Um, if you know fungal diseases pop up in a hospital or other states and they need um, a subject matter expert, uh, we get looped in. So lots of different things going on, um, all very exciting. Great, thanks, Karen. If you need any info about, uh, you know, sea otters, just ask me. I've I've learned a lot about on Animal Planet with my boys. But, anyways, uh, David, uh, you want to talk a little bit about your uh, EIS experience? Sure. So, like everyone, I've done some COVID work and then some in my home branch. The the um, COVID work, my um, first deployment, we're, I'm going to do another one in a, about a month and change here, but um, first one was working with the schools group. Um, that was looking mostly at test to stay last fall when that was sort of the hot thing um, to be thinking about. And so I did some remote work and then I went with a team to East St. Louis. It was actually a really cool deployment that I, I kind of was very proud to be part of um, looking at how we can think about health equity in implementation of that program, because there's a lot of concern that it was very resource intensive. And the initial sites where it was attempted were all tend to be very wealthy locations. And so there was some work that, C, um, that CDC and the state health department did, and I was part of to kind of evaluate whether it was sustainable there. So that was awesome. Uh, we have a publication coming out next week, next week, next week's TMS will be on that. So uh, Tuesday monthly seminar, which is sort of the EIS noon conference, if you will, um, for, um, um, on that. Um, most of my work otherwise is on HIV clusters, as I already mentioned. Um, we do a lot of work. Most of it is supporting state and local health departments. So we have, we give them tools with which to um, detect HIV clusters that are growing rapidly um, and to detect where rapid transmission is happening and to intervene. Um, most we do some of the detection ourselves, but the goal always is, you know, the, the, who is going to intervene on those clusters is going to be local health departments. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for CDC to be call, calling, you know, calling the shots, but to provide tools for which to do the work. And so that's kind of been my role has been supporting several health departments. And currently we're about to start an, um, an epi actually um, in the next few weeks to, um, to deploy to a specific jurisdiction to help them um, with a, um, some clusters of rapid transmission that they're seeing. Can't see more than that because it's not yet public, but <laughs> that's what's coming up. All right. Thanks, David. All right, Aaron, you're up. Um, I'm, I'm a field officer, so I'm, I'm based in North Carolina uh, and I'm embedded there in their health department. So my projects are really whatever is happening in North Carolina, uh, which of course right now is mostly COVID is happening in North Carolina, but um, I've done outbreak investigations of COVID in a hospital setting where a significant amount of transmission was occurring in employees. I've done outbreak investigations on completely unrelated things such as uh, Legionella. Um, I've done, um, projects about how we're recording and reporting deaths in North Carolina and whether it's, um, as accurate as it could be, 
Um, that was my, my surveillance evaluation project. And um, that work is actually going to result in some big changes to how North Carolina reports their deaths that should be coming up in the next few weeks. So if you start to hear angry news articles about that, it's my fault. You can blame me. Um, it should be great. I'm very excited. Um, but it's it's really fun and really varied. You never know what's going to happen. I'm actually so excited to hear that you all have expertise in sea otters because one of the other things that I do is I uh, will sometimes answer the phone line for our um, state epidemiology um, on call line. And recently we did receive a call of somebody who swears they were bitten by a sea otter in the middle of the state, which seems unlikely to me, but um, we did recommend they see their doctor anyway. Um, so I'll have to pick your brains about that. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, there's a lot of biting things out there we need to be careful of. So, um, all right. Well, thank you all for sharing some of your guys' experience. So we, we got a, a question in the chat that I think would be helpful if each of you could answer. And the question is, how did you manage to um, integrate the epi-elective training into your course and your clinical training requirements? I'm happy to start. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so it has been a little while. And so I think the epi elective program, um, is now there's like a set time, which actually would make things a lot easier. Previously, the epi elective program, like had different time periods that you could choose. And then you would, uh, essentially be made aware. Um, and you just had to go during that time, I believe. So hopefully the epi elective program can, uh, confirm that. Um, however, what I did was I actually blocked off as much time as possible in subsequent months. So like I did like a whole six months and I just blocked it all off so that if I got in, like this was a giant block of time where I could schedule the six to eight weeks anywhere in those six months, if possible. And then I scheduled everything around that. So like any of my outside, um, clinical rotations at like vet clinics or at like the Georgia department of public health or other like places that can be more flexible. I scheduled them around my epi elective. And I can jump in very quickly on how the rotations work. So we used to do it that way. Um, but what we found is that by putting students in cohorts, it creates more opportunities for networking among students. And so now our options are two rotations in January and two rotations in March. So there's a six week option in January and an eight week option in January, and then also a six week in March and an eight week in March as well. When you're applying to the program, you'll have the opportunity to select all that apply. So all of the different rotations that you're available for, and that's going to help us with the matching algorithm. So if you're selected as a finalist for the program, and you've selected your availability for all four rotations, there'll be a higher likelihood of you matching with a host site. So availability does matter. Uh, I think very similarly, once I learned that this was an opportunity, I very um, carefully tried to put a huge chunk of time in my schedule for it, um, which my school did not understand whatsoever. Um, they were very confused as to why I wanted to schedule things the way I did. I'm very happy that I did it, um, but I would highly recommend having ongoing conversations with your school if your school is like mine and does not like to personalize things, perhaps, um, for things that are not um, they're more standard rotations because after a lot of conversations with people, it made a lot more sense to them uh, why I wanted to schedule like three months of online electives in case I wanted to switch around the time last minute, um, which I did end up doing for when I got my dates for EEP. Yeah, I'm just been a minute. Um, I was trying to remember, but I remember like I basically planned my fourth year anticipating I was going to try to do this program and started conversations with people on the earlier side. Um, and then also kind of gave myself a bolus of time where um, I had some flexibility. And I think I had to do like one week less of the EP than initially because my school was like hard pass. You can't miss that week of didactics or something. I, I, um, I remember it was a small little fire to put out, but it wasn't that bad. Um, and it, once we figured out where I was going and everything, it worked out. 
Great, thanks. You know, our comments about sea otters have generated a lot of interest in some of the chat, but uh, as far as other things to share with the audience, you know, for people out there that are listening to, you know, this panel here today, what advice would you have to people that are, you know, considering about applying to the Epilective program and potentially considering blending, you know, clinical training and uh, public health? I think I, and I, this is probably what I already said, um, but I think you'll have a different experience here than if you're doing, even if you're like considering an MPH, I guess if maybe you work with a local health department, it'll might be a little similar, but my experience was all very academic, publish the paper, do the analysis, that sort of thing. And it's a very different environment when you're trying to take public health action. And even if during your eight weeks or whatever timeline you are here for, that doesn't happen, you will at least be a part of it and be working with people who that is their end goal. As, um, and so I think if you're, if you're at all interested in a career in public health, and you're like, well, I'm not much of an academic person because that was sometimes a turnoff for me. Um, that's not what you're, you're here to do. Um, and I, so I think that for me is, is like why I really valued the experience too, because it really solidified that this is a very different environment. I had a statistician in the cubicle next to me for when I was doing the analysis, to be clear, which is actually really nice compared to the academic environment where I had to go beg somebody to help me. Whereas there's somebody whose job it is to help get this work done. That's next to me in the cubicle and <laughs> at our office. But, um, beyond that, it was also just, uh, a different experience. So I really recommend it. I, I I really highly recommend it. I mean, if this is something that I pretty much my thought process is if you have gone to the point where you are seeing this webinar and you are a candidate for this program, you should apply to this program because you are the person that we probably want and will probably want the experiences from this program. If this sounds at all interesting, it is for you. Uh, don't worry about whether you think you're the best candidate for it. You might be applied. It's the only way you find out. Um, this this. I, I love I love taking care of patients and I love public health and um, I, I at some point may see more patients than I am right now because right now I'm just working on public health work, but I don't think I'll ever give up public health and I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't been able to get into this and really get that experience. I could easily have fallen down the other end and ended up in academic medicine, writing those papers on repeat, uh, like David's worst nightmares, um, which, you know, it, it's, it, I'm really, I really am happy to be making that difference. And that's something that I hope to do for the rest of my career. Sorry, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like, um, you know, our experiences at CDC and the Epi Elective Program are just our experiences. You know, we're three people who did this program. There are many, many students out there who have different experiences and they're not necessarily reflective of what we've seen. So, you know, like, and also we are only a slight representation of like what MDs and DVMs and medical professionals do at CDC. So like Aaron said, if you're even thinking about doing it, it's or doing public health, it's worth looking into so that not only do you get firsthand experience working on some of these projects that we do, but also you can talk to others at CDC. The epidemiology elective program is a great way to meet public health professionals, especially in the federal government. If you're at a local, then at the local government, and then you can chat with these people to see like how they do feel about integrating medical, you know, their medical profession into public health decisions. Um, everyone's job is is slightly different and everyone treats, you know, approaches things at a different way. So it's just very insightful to hear from other people like at CDC and just to pitch ideas to them, see what their experiences were. Um, and you'll find that like everyone is so willing to talk and loves talking about public health because that's what we're all here for. Over. Great. Thank you. Um, I know it's been answered in the chat, but since we had several questions, I don't know Kelly or Harrison, if one of you want to talk about, there seems to be a lot of interest as far as what makes a candidate competitive. You know, how did we, how are we, has such great wisdom that we knew that Aaron, David, and Karen would excel in Appelective and go on to these great public health careers? What is it that we're looking for in applicants? I feel like I should go back to their applications and try to pick out exactly why we selected them for this program. 
I think that would be a, a fun a fun activity for the program to learn a little bit about um, our selection process. Um, so we we look at all the applications. We typically receive around 120, 150 applications per year. And we mentioned that we accept about 50 to 60 applicants and match them with different host sites. Um, I will mention that there are a lot of qualified candidates out there that we are just not able to match, unfortunately. Um, and in the future, we're looking to identify more host sites, particularly at the state and local health departments, so we can place more students um, and again, fill some of those spots with qualified candidates. In terms of what we're looking for, we do an application review process. So we do have a very standardized way we take a look at applications. Um, and so some of the things that we're looking for, Harrison already mentioned in the chat. So um, your education and experience, um, this doesn't mean that you've needed to have a full-time job for a very long time. It's just, we're looking for sort of a breadth of experience, potentially something public health related, within your experiences, and these can be volunteer experiences or work experiences. Um, we're just kind of looking for the, the sort of the breadth of um, your experience in general. Um, we also look for your history of professional development. And so these don't necessarily mean we're looking for you to have statistical software skills or uh, all kinds of language skills, although we, we do kind of check for those things just to, again, look at sort of you holistically and how you would fit in with public health. There's a lot of different needs in public health within our host sites. And as uh, Aaron and Karen were mentioning earlier, there's such a wide breadth of different opportunities with different host sites that we try to mark these things to get an idea of who you are and which host sites you might be um, suitable for. Um, some of the other skills that we look for, um, the history of things like writing grants to learn a little bit about your scientific writing skills. Um, we look for presentations or publications um, in medicine, veterinary medicine. It could be in public health. Um, again, you don't necessarily need to have public health experience to participate in the program. Um, other things we look for are leadership or other achievements, um, generally just experience, how well you um, work with others. Um, these are types of things that we're, we're typically trying to get, again, that holistic view of sort of who you are, your willingness to serve others and your interest in public health. Um, we also, in your personal statement, this is probably the most highly regarded part of your application. We really are looking at um, how you're motivated within public health, why you want to participate in the program, how you think this program is going to impact your career path. And again, we mentioned earlier that it's not necessarily that we're only here to recruit people who are interested in the EIS program, or we're only interested in recruiting people to come to CDC. We are truly interested in bringing students in who may even just have a speckle of interest in public health or students who are just looking for a small perspective in public health, even if that means that you all go back to clinical practice um, at the end of your medical or veterinary school. Um, so just really keeping that in mind, we, you, know, you don't need to write your entire personal statement about how you wanna do EIS if you don't really wanna do EIS. We wanna learn about you, and we wanna learn about what you're interested in so that we can get an idea of how you fit um, into our host site offerings. And as I said, most candidates who apply, you are all very well qualified. You've made it this far. You're in medical school, you're in veterinary school. You are all qualified to be in public health. What we're looking for is how we can match you well with the different host site offerings that we have at the agency. And sometimes that means that we don't match really good qualified candidates. Over. Thanks, Kelly. That's a really helpful overview. And like Kelly said, even if you have just that spackling or whatever little something of interest in, in public health, this is a great opportunity to explore it. The other thing I just want to mention is under Kelly's leadership, this program continues to evolve. And there's some awesome new elements that I don't think were in place when Karen, David, and Aaron did it, which is one, there's this orientation that we offer for everyone. And now you have this great opportunity that even if you choose a state or local health department assignment, which is a great assignment, if you've never worked in public health and you've never worked at a state or local health department, this is where it happens. This is where the rubber meets the road, as they say, and this is where people should consider getting that experience. So 
you can now have that assignment of state local health department. And we still have this orientation that we bring people to CDC in person for a couple day orientation. You get to meet some of our staff, you get to meet leadership, you get to meet your other um, members of the cohort before you go out to your assignment. Um, so that's one thing that's really been awesome. And the second element is the fact that we do have all these expanded placements at state or local health departments. We didn't always have that. It used to be limited to CDC headquarters, which is a great opportunity. But if you really wanna understand public health, it's not here at CDC per se. It's really getting that experience at a state or local health department first, gaining that, and then that really informs your thinking and your work someday when you do come to CDC. So they're both great opportunities, but the program continues to evolve and expand. It keeps getting, as some people said, it's awesome. So it gets awesomer or more awesome every year. And it's in part because of the great people we can attract, like the Karens, the Davids, and the Aarons. So we hope that many of you will really consider this program and tell your friends about it too. So uh, the next thing I want to ask is for Karen, Aaron, and David is what's something that really surprised you in your epileptic experience, something that you didn't anticipate, not necessarily that you're going to get sent out on this or whatever, but what was something about the experience that you didn't anticipate that kind of surprised you? This may first. sound really, oh, oh good. Okay. No, go. <laughs> this may sound a little bit stupid, but everyone was incredibly accessible. Um, I came from a pretty rigid hierarchical um, medical school where um, if you didn't use a doctor before someone's name, um, you would probably get a talking to. Um, and I was told many times to stop calling people doctor so-and-so during my time at the EEP elective. They, um, it, it, everybody was, um, they wanted to really break down any kind of hierarchical barriers because they wanted that communication between the elective students and then everybody else working on the team. They wanted to make sure that you knew you were part of the team and that you were an important part of the team and that you were involved in everything that was going on. And that, I don't know why it surprised me, but it, it did. And it was such a friendly environment, an environment where you could really jump in and do things. I found that to be a big surprise for me. Thanks. Karen? Yeah. Um, I think one thing that happened during my epi elective. So, you know, we were working on an um, epi aid for this mass exposure and we were, you know, administering questionnaires to hundreds of households. So like, I think like 300 or 400 households. So this was a really big lift for CDC. Um, and so this started out at the branch level, but eventually got a little bit um, too big for us to handle. And so we put out a request to CDC as a whole agency, to EIS officers, to epidemiology elective students, to all others who are very busy. Um, um, and we had a call center and we had so many volunteers come in and just to vo you know volunteer to essentially read off of a scripted questionnaire and ask people if they've drunk raw milk in the near past, if they had had any, you know, signs, symptoms, and, you know, their knowledge, attitudes, and practices towards raw milk. And we had so many volunteers and like, I don't think it's necessarily surprising to me that, you know, public health professionals are passionate about public health, but more just that so many people were willing to take time out of their very, very busy day just to support this response. And this was even, this is just so obvious during the COVID response. It almost sounds silly that I'm like harping on a call center of like, you know, 10 people. Now we have like this huge agency response and people are taking the times out of their very busy schedule just to support our agency goals. And it's just and, you know, it's not only like surprising to see how many people do um, and participate and volunteer, but it's also just like very uplifting and like gives you hope. <laughs> so thank you. We all, we all need some hope a lot of these days. So that's great. David, did you want to comment? Um, I was trying to think of like specific things that were surprising. I mean, I think that the thing that was surprising in both when I was doing my EEP and in the AIS is just the value of how many different backgrounds people and how many different flavors of training people come in with at CDC. And then a the huge value that every individual brings because 
something that is obvious to you because of your training will not be obvious to somebody else and vice versa. And then you get all of these variety of perspectives at CDC that are just so unique. And like the best part actually in a lot of ways, especially when I was in Atlanta EEP was just the long list of conversations. My supervisor and my EEP was like, meet this person, meet this person, meet this person. And everyone just like made an hour, just like shoot the breeze with me about public health. And that's when I was like, wow, people like have a lot of different backgrounds that go into this. They all have very different perspectives. This one's PhD in microbiology. This one's epi, this one's a vet. Like it was just such a, um, an eye-opening experience because of just the diversity of perspectives people bring and everyone actually really brings something different that's really needed for the work that we do. Great. Thanks to all of you. So we've got about nine minutes left. And I just want to encourage anyone that has a question to throw it out to us because we'd rather focus our remaining time on answering anything that's really going to be helpful to you if you're considering applying or want more information about this program. I don't see any open questions in the chat right now. All right, so we'll see if something pops up in the meantime. Are there any parting words that any of the three of you would like to share? If you think back to when you were in your veterinary or your medical training and you're kind of wondering about, you know, is, is public health the direction I want to go? Even though Erin knew since she was eight or nine, I can't remember. And Karen no, already no, it had was, her- No, no, it was 12. Don't, don't, 12, don't, sorry. don't oversell it. It's- Yeah. I, 12 and Karen, you already had your MPH. You, you had, you know, you were kind of thinking there, but is there anything that you'd want to share that you think would be really helpful that was back in your thinking back then as you were along that continuum of, of planning for that transition from going from clinical to public health training? I, I want to make sure everybody knows it doesn't have to be one or the other. A lot of people do both. And there are a variety of ways to do that, especially from a local health department uh, situation. If you if you are at all interested in being the first person to get the sea otter bite call, you know, look at the local health departments. Um, really consider working with them because um, if if you if you are torn between clinical and public health work, that is a great place where you can do both because a lot of people, especially at a local le level, will have a local clinic and then also do their local public health work. It's a, it's a huge thing. Don't feel like it has to be one or the other. And you have to choose right now when you apply for this program, because one great thing about this program is that it'll give you some experience to see if this is something you want to pursue long-term. Karen or David, anything you want to add? I don't think so. I was thinking like, it's okay if you feel like <clears throat> in your medical training, especially if you're like in medical school now, and then you're about to do residency, sometimes you'll enjoy residency and other times you'll probably feel like a bit of a fish out of the water and that's fine too. <laughs> um, and so like, if that happens, maybe you should maybe keep considering public health. And then also, I, I think the other thing that's really um, important to do now that now I thought of something that's helpful. If you make, if you do this program, you make relationships here, keep in touch with those people. Um, like, it's, it's true everywhere in life, but especially like CDC and working in public health, it's all about the relationships you know and the network that you have in terms of your ability to, to get things done. And just to, if you're interested in it, just maintain those relationships, even though you're busy um, during residency, because it's really just helpful to kind of be able to talk to folks um, and then potentially that there's um, possible work in the future that comes from those conversations. So that's great, David. So, you know, it seems like you made some relationships during Epi Elective is that kind of how you maintain ties to public health while you're wrapping up your clinical training as you transition then to EIS? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was in touch with um, someone in um, Center for Global Health all throughout residency. She was sometimes frustrated with me when I'd be super slow when I was working a block of nights, but <laughs> to respond to emails. But um, yes, that's that's the honest way. And, you know, and, and also just someone that I worked with when I was doing my MPH, but who also had um, CDC's ties. So I, it was just an important thing to kind of, we were working on a paper, but I think even if you're not doing that, um, I think just reaching out, asking if you can just touch base with people, check in, say, hey, I'm still thinking about this. If you do this program or if you don't, I mean, just maintain the network that you have in public health because those conversations are helpful. Um, 
to, as you think about what you're going to do with your um, career, whether or not you want to work at CDC or a, a local health department. To add okay. to that, I, ahead, I didn't, oh no, sorry. Okay. Um, I didn't, I didn't have an ongoing project after I finished EEP um, with, with the folks that I worked with, but um, I, I mentioned that swamp cancer case before, and I actually ended up joining a support group for people who had pets affected by um, this OMICDs. And several years later, um, another human uh, did become infected. And I found out on this Facebook page and actually was messaging, I, I sent an email to uh, my previous CDC supervisor and said, hey, there's actually another human case right now. I don't know if you've heard about this and they had not yet. So you never know. That's really interesting. And, and you know, Aaron, I think that even though you necessarily didn't focus on those connections, I think you still had a strong public health connection. During, I think you had a minor endeavor on the side that you were working on that kept you connected with public health. You want to talk a little bit about that? So I'm a complete lunatic and um, I decided that residency wasn't quite strenuous enough and that I really needed to um, have another, you know, really large scale project um, to spend all of my time and energy on because I was getting too much sleep. Um, so what I decided to do was to work with um, a, a local um, a community community health project and uh, set up a formal legalized uh, syringe exchange program in my area, which did not have any sort of harm reduction, um, official harm reduction uh, systems in place. So um, it was started, I, I founded a, a nonprofit that now provides harm reduction, a wide variety of harm reduction um, strategies to the inland Southern California area. And um, while I was struggling with um, COVID and doing nothing but COVID in, in the ICU uh, at the end of my residency, um, the harm reduction group was saving literally hundreds of lives with Narcan. They were able to pass out. So it was, um, it was a pretty fantastic project. I, I perhaps don't recommend it for the sleep aspect, but um, I, uh, I wanted to do public health and after EP, I knew I wanted to do public health and I always had my eyes open for things that needed to be done and that I could help with. And I jumped on it when it happened and it was awesome. Thanks. That's really helpful. So it's just showing that, you know, when you do epilective, it doesn't have to be the end of your, you, you don't have to go into, you know, a hole and hide from public health until you get into the next phase. You know, you saw there's kind of um, lower intensity things that David elected to do, like maintaining relationships with people from CDC to the opposite of the, the insanity spectrum where Aaron decided to start a nonprofit and save thousands of lives. So um, Karen, is there anything else that uh, you, you wanted to add? Um, yeah, just like recapping everything that's sort of been said. And I think like one of the like key points is that this is just such a great exposure into CDC and the federal government. It is it can be challenging to sort of, um, you know, have your foot in the door. And this is just, a, just such a great way. I, I feel like that's what, this is what clinics is for is to explore different options and like what you want to do with your life. And there's no other time that you can just spend six weeks floating from here to there, to different branches, to local health departments, to federal. And like, it's just a great time and an excellent program to, um, really for you to experience like what is possible with CDC and how things work with at, at, at a federal and or state level. Okay. Well, that seemed like a, a drop the mic moment right there. So I don't think I have anything else to say. I'll hand it back over to uh, Kelly. Anything you want to send us home with? No, thank you all for joining us today, Eric, David, Aaron, and Karen. Um, thank you for your experiences and for such high praise of the program. Um, we certainly appreciate it, and we look forward to um, all of the applicants uh, for this year's program for spring of 2023. Um, to close out, we do have a quick request. Um, we are opening an evaluation for this webinar today so we can get a better idea of what applicants of the program are looking for in the future. Um, we're going to drop that link in the chat. It should just take you just a couple of minutes, and we would really appreciate if you could offer that feedback for us. Uh, thank you, Erin, for dropping that in there. Uh, and that should be it. Um, thank you all again for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to check out our website, cuc.gov backslash epi elective. 
or contact us at epielective at cdc.gov. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you in the future at CDC. Thank you.